So you um, you are open about being a therapist who has been in therapy, and my first question is to ask you about what that's been like for you um, uh, to be out of the closet as a therapist who's been in therapy, and if you find yourself ever kind of having that sense of like, oh, maybe I've said too much. Like, what has been what's been the process so far of your coming out journey as a therapist who has been in her own therapy? Right. So I, I don't think it was a big, it's a big secret that therapists go to therapy. Um, but I still think that there's a lot of stigma around the idea of getting help for emotional struggles. And, you know, I think that we, we value our emotional health differently than we value our physical health. And part of the reason I wanted to write this book was I, I follow around, or you bring you guys into my therapy room of four patients, and then there are others woven throughout, but four main people. And then there's a fifth patient, and that fifth patient is me. And it's me going to my therapist. And I wanted to do that because I didn't want to be the expert up on high. I wanted to be um, just another person who's going through life. and. Um, and so I really felt like one of the one of the messages of the book is that we're more the same than we are different. And I really hope that that's what I'm showing by revealing myself that way in the book. Um, I have been similarly out about being in both individual and couples therapy. And I will say it's much easier to be out about being in couples therapy now that Barack and Michelle are out <laughs> about having been in couples therapy. Well, it's, it's interesting because I, I, um, I just, the book just came out about a week ago and um, most of my interviewers have been very public about being in therapy, which I think is, is a really gratifying result of the book. So when I was on Terry Gross, when I was on Fresh Air, she said to me right before going on air, she said, I've been in therapy for a long time. I don't know if I'm going to mention it on the air, but I just want you to know that's the context behind some of my questions. And then she said it on the air, and I was so grateful to her for doing that. And I did an event with Katie Couric, who talked about her therapy, and I did an event with Scott Simon, who talked about his therapy in these very public venues. Um, and Alexandra's talking about her being in therapy. So I, I think that creates an openness, and it kind of normalizes the experience. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Um, I love the part about when you are first in the throes of the breakup with boyfriend. Your squad, your group of friends, mm -hmm. did what every good group of friends should do. The therapists in the friend group diagnosed him with all variety of type of mental disorder, <laughs> as they should do. And then your non-therapist friends just diagnosed him as an asshole. Right, so, so my therapist friend said he was avoidant and my non-therapist friend said he was asshole. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's the difference, though, between what your friends will do for you and what a therapist will do for you. And just to give you guys some context, because this is the very beginning of the book, it's not a book about a breakup. That's where it starts. But it becomes something very, very different, which is, I think, what happens when people come to therapy. The presenting problem ends up being kind of a, a way of getting them into therapy. And then, um, you know, I'm always listening for really kind of the music under the lyrics. What is it that something brought them into therapy, but what is the underlying pattern or struggle that got them into that situation in the first place? So the book starts off where um, the person that I thought I was going to marry um, told me that he didn't want to live with a kid under his roof for the next 10 years. That kid was my eight-year-old. Um, my eight-year-old had not been like hiding in the closet for the last, you know, for the time that we were dating. Um, but he, his kids were about to leave for college and he was about to experience this empty nest and he apparently had been really grappling with that for a long time but hadn't talked to me about it because he kept trying to work it out for himself that he would be okay with this. And, but to me, it was, I was really blindsided by it. I didn't see it coming at all. And so of course my friends took my side. I talk in the book about the difference between idiot compassion and wise compassion. And idiot compassion is what we do with our friends. We don't want to rock the boat. We want to support them. We want them to feel, you know, we want to take their side. So all of my friends were, you know, saying, you know, you, you dodged a bullet and, you know, all of those things. Um, but a therapist will, will give you wise compassion. And wise compassion is holding up the mirror to you so you can see a reflection of yourself. And in that reflection, you can see something that you don't already see, something that you're unaware of. So how are you shooting yourself in the foot? How do you keep doing the same things over and over? 
Um, and so when I go to my therapist, I'm going for what a lot of people go for, which is validation. I want him to say, yeah, you really dodged a bullet, just like my friends did. But that's not what he does. <laughs> but you try. You try for a while. You, you are my, she's bringing in email. She's really trying to build a case. I'm for, bringing in my source material, yes. You're like, unlike everybody else who played a part in their breakup, you really need to understand that this is a blind side. Yeah, it's really, you put up a good fight. Yeah. And, he, and it speaks to the quality of the relationship that you, you soften, you lean in, you allow him to, you know, your therapist to sit near you and help you unpack the pieces that, that are closer to the bone. And that's, um, that's what good therapy does. Yeah, and it's a, really, it's a really interesting thing, the relationship between a therapist and somebody who's going to therapy. Um, you know, study after study shows that the most important factor in the therapy being successful is your relationship with your therapist. It matters more than the person's training or years of experience or the modality they're using, all of which are important, of course, but they're not as important as that relationship. And the therapist I end up going to, um, I get to him because I was asking for a friend, and, um, and then later I tell the person who referred me that it was actually for me. But um, he, at the time I was a newer therapist, and he was much more experienced than I was, and he, unlike in my training where we were taught certain ways of being in the room, he just brought his whole self into the room. He was very boundary, he didn't disclose things about his personal life, but he was just a real person in the room in a way that helped me to become a better therapist as well. I want to ask you about your stories that are about your courageous nose. You have an interesting career trajectory where, so first job out of college is working um, in, on TV shows that we all know and love. She worked on ER, she worked on um, Friends. And then she has this like, courageous no where she realizes uh, on the set of ER that you're more interested in the stories of the patients than in the show itself. So she goes to medical school. And in her journey in medical school, there's another courageous no, which is actually I'm more interested in the, in the story of the patient behind the patient. And you do a courageous no and shift again to therapy. To, to training as journalism. a therapist. Well, I, do, I do journalism first. And then, so yeah. I, I suspect that there are some of us in this room who are sitting with that inconvenient, rumbling no inside of us, right? The no that we don't really want to look at, where we're on this path and it's going to be really inconvenient to change course. And I think you are in a place to be a really powerful teacher around how and when to breathe into that courageous no. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey of the courageous no? Sure. Um, so uh, at first I was, when I graduated from college, I was really, I was always interested in story and the human condition. And I loved the way that film and TV did that. Really good movies and really good television. Um, and I started working in that industry. Um, when I got to NBC, the first, the first two shows that were just premiering were, were Friends and ER. And I, I hung out a lot with our consultant, who was uh, a real ER doctor. And I really, I really liked being there in the ER. I felt like there was so much happening on a, on a really rich human level that fiction couldn't really capture. So he kept saying to me, you know, you, I think you like it better here than you like your day job, because I would never want to go back to the office. Um, and, and I really thought that it was too late for me to go to medical school. I was like 27 at the time. And, um, and but I did, I, I, I went to medical school. And when I got to medical school, I was at Stanford where it was ground zero for the dot-com boom and right before the bust. And um, this new thing called managed care was coming in. And a lot of my professors were saying that I wouldn't be able to um, really have those, those long, those deeper relationships with my patients, that sort of long-term guiding them through their lives kind of relationship that I imagined. Um, and I started writing around that time as well. And I ended up leaving medical school to become a journalist, which I liked very much because I went from sort of telling fictional stories to seeing real stories in medical school to being able to tell real people's stories as a journalist. And I really, I loved that. And I did it for, for more than a decade and I still do it. Um, but then I had a baby. And once I had a baby, I realized that, you know, I needed, I needed colleagues. I needed adult humans to talk to during the day. And so I called up the dean at, at Stanford, who I had become very close with because I used to run her mother-daughter book groups. 
And she, I said, maybe I should come back and do psychiatry. And you know, then I can have colleagues and I can make people happy and it'll be great. And she laughed at me and said, psychiatrists don't make people happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, but she, she had nothing against psychiatrists. It was more that, it was more that she was saying, you would be prescribing Celexa in 15 minute intervals all day long. You would hate this. This is not what you talked about when you were in medical school. So she suggested that I get a graduate degree in clinical psychology and do psychotherapy, which is what was the best suggestion I think anybody ever could have given me. Um, and at the time, of course, I was, I was, now I was almost 40 at that point, but I was so eager to have these other human interactions where the UPS guy would come, I was ordering all these baby supplies all the time, and you know, I'd be like, how about those diapers, and how's the weather, and he would be backing away to his big brown truck, and you know something's wrong when the UPS guy is avoiding you. Um, so I did, I went to graduate school, and I went through the whole process, and took my boards, and became a psychotherapist, where now, I, as a journalist, I still tell people stories, but now, I think as a therapist, I have a small part in helping people to change their stories. So I think when you talk about the courageous no, um, I think that it was more like a courageous yes, that, um, that sometimes you don't know where a path is going to lead, but if you are doing it for the right reasons, it, it tends to work itself out. And I think so many people want to have control over their lives, and they want to know the answer first, and, and me too. But I think I, I got to the, this place in my life that I never would have gotten to in terms of really taking all of my passions and interests um, and, and melding a career around that. Um, so I, I feel really excited when I wake up every day. And so that, I think, is the courageous yes. Yeah. And the courageous yes was from a place of continuing to check in with your deep truth. What felt most compelling to you about each of the, each of the chapters of the story? You kind of followed what was most compelling to you and took it to the next chapter. Right, right. And I think, you know, maybe we should talk a little bit about my patients, because I think that you see that with, with them as well. Um, maybe I should give you guys a little, a little bit about yes. who they are. Yes. Um, so I wanted to um, follow very different people. Um, so the people that you would be reading about in the book are um, different ages, different gender, different life histories, different personalities, different problems. And, um, but I think that we can see aspects of ourselves in all of these people. And that's what I think is so fascinating about, about the work that we do and what I hope readers will see. Um, the first person that, that you meet in the book is um, somebody that I named John in the book. And he's, um, he's very abrasive. He has um, what we might call narcissistic tendencies. Um, he is um, insulting to me. He tells me that he's come to me because I'm a nobody and he won't run into any of his colleagues from the television industry, which is where he works, um, in the waiting room because I'm the nobody. And he um, tells me that he doesn't want his wife to know that he's coming to therapy, so he's going to hand me a wad of cash at the end. And he says, you'll be just like my mistress. Um, which he thinks is, is hilarious, and then he says, but actually, no, you're not the kind of person I would choose as a mistress. You'd be more like my hooker. Um, and so people think, well, why would you see someone like that, right? But I think what you come to realize is that people, when people act a certain way, it's, it's their protection. They're protecting themselves against something that is unspeakable, um, you know, so traumatic that they, they find a way to manage and cope. And I think that that can help all of us be, be more compassionate when we, when we encounter people who are behaving a certain way and not personalize it so much. He becomes the person that readers of the book tend to love the most. They come to love him because once you see the trauma and the tragedy, which we're not going to talk about here because we don't want to spoil it for you, but um, once you see what is motivating this, why he uses this as his defense, um, I think that he becomes this incredibly likable person and he becomes so relatable. And so many times I think people hide the truth of who they are because they are afraid that people won't like them or love them if they reveal who they are. And what people come to discover through therapy is that, and even just in the world, if they're not in therapy, if you, if you show people, if you share yourself with people, that's what draws people toward you. That's what's going to make them want to be with you. So we see his evolution uh, from this, this very, so we say, charming guy <laughs> at the beginning um, to, to someone that, that I think becomes very, very human. 
There's a 25-year-old um, a who keeps hooking up with the wrong guys, and she doesn't understand why, and at one point she even starts um, hooking up with somebody from the waiting room, which is very ill-advised. And, um, and, and she drinks a little bit too much, but you wouldn't know it if you just met her. She seems incredibly, you know, she's successful at her job, she has a lot of friends, um, but she's got a lot of struggle underneath. And um, she's a good example of someone who, um, you know, clings to these patterns and is very unaware of what these patterns are. She doesn't realize what her own role is in this, you know, always being disappointed by men. Um, and then there's a, a woman who is um, in her 30s and she just got married and she comes back from her honeymoon after feeling something that she thought was a sign of pregnancy in her breast and it's actually a sign of cancer. And um, she has what they think is a very treatable form of breast cancer but then six months later she gets a scan and she has this very aggressive form of terminal cancer and she asks me to stay with her until she dies and it was the story of of our relationship as she goes through this this coming to terms with her own death. Um, and how she handles it, I think, can teach us a lot about, um, you know, this experience of we don't know how we're going to react until we get there. And I think it shouldn't take a terminal illness to make people think about um, really being aware of our mortality and being really intentional about not wasting time and she notices that people keep putting off things for later. You know, I'll do it later. In three years, we're going to do this. Next summer, we're going to do this. And what are we really waiting for? And I think her story is really thought-provoking in that way. And then lastly, there's um, this woman who is about to turn 70, and she um, feels like she really made a mess of her life. Her adult children don't talk to her. She's had some marriages that didn't work out. She's one of the most isolated people that I have ever met, and she's heartbroken and clinically depressed. And she says if things don't get better in a year, she doesn't want to live anymore. And it may sound like, well, what, what could really change in a year? And, and on the one hand, yes. But I think when people come to therapy, they're very, there's a reason that they came at that time. And so when people come in, I don't always, you know, I want to know why. I want to know why, why they came in. But I also want to know why now. Why this week or this month did you decide to call me and come in when you've had this problem for a very long time. Because I'm scanning for strengths as much as I am looking for what is not working. And one strength is their readiness to change. And she was primed to change, and she really does. I want to stay with her for a moment, Rita. Sure. Um, because there's a, there's a scene where she does begin to change, and she starts to sit with the possibility of no longer being in isolation. And you have this beautiful line she has a, a sort of a sexy parking lot kiss, Rita does. And she calls you in a panic then. And you write, but now the kiss has presented another crisis for Rita, possibility. And that may feel even more intolerable to her than her pain. Can you talk about that? Why sometimes we opt for pain over possibility? Yeah, I think you see that with every person in, in this book. Um, there's this word, cherophobia, which means fear of joy. A lot of us have it and don't realize it, which is that um, for people who have grown up in a way where they got a taste of something good happening and then it would go away, um, joy isn't something pleasant. It's almost like anticipatory pain. Um, you see that with Rita, with her parents. She'd get a taste of joy and then it would get taken away. It wouldn't last. Her mother would be very... Um, distant and then she would all of a sudden pay attention to her and she would start to feel like, oh, this is going to be good and then of course it wouldn't be good. Um, you see that with Charlotte, the young woman who keeps hooking up with the wrong guys, um, where her father would disappear and then come back and everything was great and then he would disappear. So for her again, it's very dangerous connection and feeling, feeling like someone might come close to you feels threatening in a way. So there are, there are a lot of ways that when, when Rita, this, this older woman, um, meets this man and he is interested in her and he's a really nice guy which she hasn't had before and he kisses her and de declares his love for her she's terrified she's angry in fact because at first he wasn't interested in her and he was interested in a, a different woman so she she has a lot of reasons why she can say this is not going to work out 
But I think the real terror is the terror of being happy because it's almost like, and we're just waiting for the piano to fall from the sky again. Well, and she has to then forgive herself, right? If she were to see Myron, if she were to let herself be seen by Myron the way that he sees her, right? He sees her with great fondness and appreciation. And if she were to allow herself to be seen in that way, like she needs to kind of forgive herself for that. And yeah, we, we, there's a lot about forgiveness in, in the book, and I think it's different from the way that people tend to think about forgiveness. I think we're always told, um, it's kind of a popular way of thinking about forgiveness, is that if you forgive someone, you will feel better. And I say, you can have compassion for someone without forgiving them. That sometimes forgiveness can be a great relief if you forgive somebody else, um, but sometimes you don't actually forgive the person, and forced forgiveness feels worse. Forced forgiveness is when you, the culture, people in your life, family members, think that you need to forgive somebody even though you actually don't, and then you don't feel that relief. So you can have compassion for maybe why the person did what they did, but that doesn't mean you have to forgive them. The person you have to forgive is yourself. So with Rita, her situation was she, um, when she got married very young, she dropped out of college and married someone she met in college, and she was trying to escape her parents. And she, um, the person that she married was great for the first couple of years, and then they started having kids, and he started drinking, and he started um, being abusive um, to the kids. And Rita didn't protect them. She didn't know where she would go, how she would survive, what she would do. Um, it was a different generation also. And, um, and she really, she didn't do what she should have done as their mother. And she, they didn't forgive her for that. And they ended up with very, um, a lot of struggles in their own lives as they grew up. And she kept wanting their forgiveness. She wanted a relationship with them, but it wasn't their job to forgive her. It was, it was her job to come to terms with what she had done and to figure out what kind of relationship she could have with them now. Yeah. And it's that when you know better, you do better. Right? That she had to, you helped her see herself as a work in progress that she gets to. You kept asking her, is this a life sentence? Right? Like, how long are you going to punish yourself? And is there any opportunity for parole, for possibility, for a new chapter to her story? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's a, I think a lot of people um, think about, um, you know, if they don't self flagellate, that somehow it, it you know, they, like they need to keep staying in prison for something that they've done. And I asked her, how long do you think your sentence should be for this crime? And she said, a life sentence. And I said, well, that's what you got. You got a life sentence. You're giving yourself a life sentence. And yes, it, it was significant in terms of what happened to her children. But at the same time, you know, could there be parole for her? Could she live with what she had done? And could she also do something different? Could she create something different at the same time? And how do we teeter on that tightrope between um, kind of guilt and redemption? So as a um, systems therapist, I want to ask you about uh, a piece that you write about, which is really acknowledging that when one person, so we are, our marriages are systems, our families are systems, and when one person uh, makes a choice to start therapy, it has a ripple effect. It, it shapes the system. It changes the system. And you write about sometimes something that we see, which is that as you, as part of a system, step into a different role, you're no longer going to play the same part in the drama of your family or of your marriage that you've played for potentially years and years and decades. And as that individual starts to step into something different, healthier, uh, there may be some unconscious sabotage on the part of the rest of the system, some pushback. I'm like, no, 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 you, we like you in that role. And you write about that really beautifully. I wonder if you could speak a little about how therapy shakes up the system. Yeah. A lot of times, I can talk about it maybe most easily with couples. So one person in the couple might say to the other, um, you know, you really need to go to therapy. <laughs> and um, and it's, or, or a person will come to therapy and say, you really need to fix my partner. Um, so it's very much about somebody else. 
And what happens is um, when one person in the system makes a change, um, the other person, it's almost like a dance, like they were doing this dance together and then when one person changes the dance steps, the other person either has to change his or her dance steps or the person falls flat on the floor. And people don't want to be what we call the identified patient, the IP, right? So in a, in a family, often it'll be the child who ends up being the IP, the identified patient. Like something is going on with our child who's reacting to the system. But um, once the child gets healthier, then the parents sort of have to look at their relationship and they might not want to do that. So it's better for them if their child is the one who's struggling. Or in the marriage, like with John and his wife, John, the, the person I was telling you about earlier, um, you know, when she starts to get healthier and she starts to kind of set boundaries with him and he's not gonna put up with his BS, all of a sudden, he's like, I kind of liked her better the other way. <laughs> you know, like he, um, you, you don't, you want to be the person who, who was thought of as the same person in the system. Um, so I think there's a lot of resistance. We do that with our friends too. Like if you and your friends or if there's, like I see this with young people a lot in their 20s, like there's they're somebody who's maybe they're a little bit, um, they're not growing up in the way that they need to grow up. And one person says, okay, I'm going to get a job now. And the other people are like, ah, you don't want to get a job. Why would you want to do that? Or, or someone wants to lose weight. And then, you know, they say, I'm going to go to the gym. And people say, oh, my God, you're no fun anymore. You don't eat burgers with us anymore. You don't drink with us at bars anymore. Um, they're sabotaging that because there's a, there's a need for them to, um, they will have to change if their friend changes. They will have to look at themselves in a new way if somebody else is making changes. I talk about that a lot when there's um, a, sort of a single, like a, somebody who's single in the dating world, and if the bulk of their friend group is in relationship, there can be a way in which the partnered friends kind of want to like have a little bit of um, voyeurism into the single friend's life, and they want to look at their phone and you know swipe on their behalf potentially, and um, and the single person can sometimes like take on this role in the friend group of being the being sort of the fun one or the one who kind of brings back you know regales the friend group about the kind of complexities of the dating world and I always want that person to be really mindful of the way in which the sharing is in their own best interest versus like performative for the benefit of the friends you know and that because we do we take on roles which is not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing but it's always that gut check around what's the place from which I'm taking on this role and what's the degree of authenticity and what's the amount of flexibility, right? Can I play other roles? Can I show other parts of myself to these to my, my crew? Um, okay, so loving after loss. This is, um, as you are, you work with Julie, um, mm -hmm. your young client who is battling cancer and, um, well, let me start with this question, which is just about Basically, her story of getting sicker and sicker, you, you have to decenter whatever idea you had about how somebody should face this and really yeah. meet her where she is. Yeah, um, I think that our, our instinct when somebody is suffering is to make them feel better. And I think with death, especially, it's to deny death completely. So um, I should say that when Julie came to me, I wasn't somebody who did oncological therapy. I wasn't somebody who had experience with um, people who were dying, and uh, particularly people who were young and dying. And um, she specifically wanted to come to me because she didn't want to be part of the what she called the cancer culture, which to her was pink ribbons and optimism and affirmations on the walls. And she just that wasn't that wasn't a good fit for her. It wasn't how she wanted to go through this experience. She was. She was incredibly interesting, and um, but very real about what was happening to her. And my instinct was to protect her, um, you know. And she would talk about. There's a chapter in the book called "What Not to Say to a Dying Person," um, because she talks very specifically about the things that people would say to her, like, "Are you sure you're dying? Did you get a second opinion? Um, you know, my cousin did this experimental treatment and did herbal teas. You know, <laughs> and it's like that wasn't very helpful to her. What was helpful was being in the reality with her. And so at one point she needs to have her colon removed and um, she's gonna get a colostomy bag. 
And I remembered in medical school that there were these colostomy bags, they were called Victoria's Other Secret. And, I'm not kidding, I'm not making this up. And they had like butterflies and peace signs and hearts on them, and you know, they were supposed to be cute. And I wanted to, I wanted to sort of tell her about those, because she said, she was really worried about her husband. She was newly married, and she said, you know, he's gonna be repulsed by this. And my instinct was to say, oh, no, 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 he's not gonna be repulsed by this, but I don't know how he's gonna feel about it. So I sat with her in that, you know, we don't, we don't know. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, my, and my instinct was to tell her about these, these cute little bags, and you know, that was not gonna help her either. Um, and she knew that I was trying to be protective of her, and she would call me on that a lot. Um, but I think what was interesting too was the way that she and her husband dealt with death because of the way we dealt with it in the therapy room. She was really envious of him in a lot of ways because she used to be a marathon runner and all of a sudden he was the one who was going to the gym and she would look at his healthy body when he'd come back from the gym and he would get to live and she wouldn't and she used to be the strong one and now he was. And, um, and one night she comes into him and, and she's doing internet research and she says, hey, look at this thing, maybe we could try this. And he, he just explodes at her. He had never done that. He'd been sort of the model support partner in this. And he just said, can't we just have one night off from cancer? And she was furious and she said, I don't get a night off from cancer. And, and it was this like, real moment for them to, to start talking about that not only was Julie going through this, but her husband was going through this too in his own way. And they were able to talk about things like how, you know, she was at first told she would have like somewhere between a year and 10 years at the bed most. And there's a huge difference between one year and 10 years. And there would be a huge difference for her husband too because he was newly married, he wanted a family, he wanted to have kids. And he, it's not that he wanted Julie to die, he wanted more than anything for her to live, but he wanted her to be healthy. And he was gonna have to put his life on hold for maybe a very long time and then have kids in his 40s, and if, whenever he met someone, maybe 50s. Um, it was gonna change his life in a lot of ways too. And these so it sounds like these are topics that are so politically incorrect to talk about, but their relationship was so rich and so full of love and so honest the way that they went through this process. So I had to do that too. She was gonna do that with her husband. I had to be able to be in the trenches with her in that very real way as well. My favorite part of that is the moment when the two of you, you and Julie, are in your therapy office and you just start screaming the F word at the top of your lungs because that was where she was and you met her in that place. And there's well, not she asked me to do that. I mean, <laughs> they don't learn that. You know, it's not any of our like, therapy textbooks. This is, you know, but that was, you went where she needed to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's, what was interesting was, so I was in therapy and I was, I was watching my therapist. I was very much a patient with my therapist, meaning you can't really backseat drive. You can't say, well, yeah, I would have done it that way. Um, but I also think that, that he taught me a lot about just really being yourself in the room, um, which is what I was doing with, with Julie there. So, you know, my therapist, it's funny that when you're a patient, you, you do all the same things that, that your patients do with you. I wanted him to like me. I'd see somebody in the waiting room as I was leaving and I'd think, oh, my session was such a downer. I'll bet he's really looking forward to hers or do, you know, does he like her better? Um, I Google stalked him one night. There's a whole episode in the book about, um, actually, it's a little bit of a tangent, but maybe I should, I, just, just to give you guys a sense of sort of that, that teetering between being the patient and being the therapist that one night he tells me that I need to stop Google stalking the boyfriend because it's, it's creating, he talks about the difference between pain and suffering and that we all have pain but we don't have to suffer so much and that my Google stalking the boyfriend was creating a lot of suffering of my own device. And so, um, and so I, I'm trying not to Google stalk my boyfriend that night. And then just on a whim, I type in my therapist's name because I had never, I never Googled him before. And, and you know the Google rabbit hole. Um, a, a, a colleague of mine calls the internet the, um, the most effective non-prescription short-term painkiller out there. And um, that was my, that was my painkiller that night. And so I just went down the Google rabbit hole, but what I discovered about him was that his father had died at a, at a relatively young age, about mid-age, middle age, and um, of a heart attack suddenly. And I had been waxing poetic in my therapy sessions about my close relationship with my 80-year-old father and how I was so glad we had this time together and it was this 
beautiful relationship because I didn't know that he had had this experience. And when I read that on the internet, I got this feeling in the pit of my stomach that, oh, I, I, I maybe shouldn't be talking about that. And so I know that my patients Google me because inevitably they slip up. They'll say something like, oh, you know what it's like raising a middle school boy. And I've never said anything that I have a child or what gender or what age. Um, I knew that I would slip up in my therapy sessions. And I, w I edited myself because I didn't want to make him feel bad by talking about all this, all this stuff that was happening with my father that was really beautiful. Um, and eventually I did confess to him and, and all the air returned to the room and I was so glad that I did. Um, and I forgot why I went off on that tangent about um, being a, we were talking about Julie. And because, oh, authenticity, you learn. Oh, authenticity, right. So, so, so my therapist was, was very authentic with me and I wanted to be that way with Julie. So sometimes, you know, I teared up when she got bad news. In this instance, she, she was saying the F word and it felt so good for her because she was such a goody goody before this. She had been like, you know, she had done everything by the book and she was, you know, checked off all the boxes and all of a sudden this new side of her opened up, um, which you can read about in the book. I don't want to spoil it, but she does all these things that she never would have done in any other circumstance. And um, she started swearing a lot, which <laughs> was also one of them. And, um, she, and we actually ended up writing her obituary together, ultimately, at the end. And um, she said, please, I don't want it to say, like, swore like a sailor. <laughs> she, become, she swore a lot after that. Um, but she was. She wanted me to yell that with her at the end. And we did. And I, I, I hesitated for a minute before I did it. And then I did it. And then I remember when I opened the door to let her go, like, everybody in the hallways was sort of looking at us in this weird way. And I thought, oh, God, they, somebody, because it was the end of the session and people were in the hallways and some, some people must have heard us. And they're probably thinking, what's going on in that room? <laughs> It's one of the dirty little secrets of therapy, I think, is how much we learn from our clients. Yeah. I watch, I mean, I will watch clients of mine make these apologies to each other, and I just, I, I get chills watching the way that they do repairs, and I think, oh boy, I need to really step up my game at home and really start to offer some more, you know, that's one of my real Achilles heels in my marriage, is just like owning my stuff and making the apology, you know, in the way that like, I know is the right way to do it. And I will watch my clients do it and I just am humbled. I think that's the thing we don't, we don't talk about that. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think we talk a lot, I think a lot of people say, when you tell them you're a therapist, they think, oh, you listen to people's problems all day. And it's not what we do. There's so much, I, I, I like to say there are heroics in that room that, um, these moments that nobody sees except me and the person there of people doing something they never thought possible of behaving in a completely different way from the way they would have when they came in of changing their lives in a really transformative way and you see these heroic moments where people are trying so hard because therapy is hard work um, you know I like to say that, that one of my favorite sort of maxims of the trade is, is insight is the booby prize of therapy and what I mean by that is that if you don't make changes, um, the insight is useless. So if you, if you know why you do something in your marriage, or you know why you keep shooting yourself in the foot in a certain way, but then you go home to the same marriage, you don't do anything different, the insight doesn't serve you in any way. So I see all of these heroic moments where people are taking what they're learning about themselves and they're actually making real tangible changes in their lives. That, um, that takes so much courage and vulnerability. And um, I think that that's some of the, the joy of being a therapist. We aren't just sitting there listening to problems all day. Well, and one of the things that I think is, um, is really important is that we as therapists learn how to and make sure we keep an eye out for bracketing those different behaviors. And I think sometimes it's easy when you are the client to take for granted. You kind of don't, you don't know your own healing and your own transformation. So I think one of the things that I love that we get to do as therapists is bracket that and be like, can we talk that through again? Because I'm watching you handle a moment very differently than you would have six months ago or a year ago. So I think that's part of the, um, just part of the work, right? Is highlighting, I'm watching you do this differently than you would have. Because I think we, I think as, I think clients can take that for granted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I want to read something else that was just really beautifully written. Um, you know, so much of our growth and healing in therapy is being able to sit 
and is to be able to tolerate more shades of gray, tolerate more complexity, right? That's so much of the growth that we do in therapy is that we learn how to sit with more messiness in our life. It's not really about healing or fixing or curing, it's about sitting more comfortably in the mess of life. And so you write, I think about how it's the not knowing that torments all of us. Not knowing why your boyfriend left, not knowing what's wrong with your body, not knowing if you could have saved your son. At a certain point, we all have to come to peace with the unknown and the unknowable. What helps you find peace with the unknown and the unknowable? Well, I think that's a lot of what happened in, in therapy, which is that, you know, it seemed like I was coming in for this boyfriend issue, but in the very first session, I said, and now half my life is over. <laughs> it was just a, ran a seemingly random thing that I said. Um, like, in I'm in my 40s now and half my life is over. And Wendell, my therapist, um, he just glommed onto that, much to my chagrin, because I was like, I'm here to talk about the boyfriend. And he said, you know, I think maybe you're grieving something bigger than the loss of your boyfriend. And we eventually started talking about how when you're, you know, I think th people think of therapy as dealing with the past, like what happened to you in the past and how that informs the present. But the present also informs the future. So when your boyfriend or a marriage ends or a child dies or, you know, any of these things that, that are very defining for in our lives happen, um, it's not just that moment of I miss the person in the present, it's the whole future that you had constructed around that relationship also dies. Um, and so I think that there's that uncertainty of now what? Now what will the future hold? So you're not just grieving in the present, but you're grieving the future of what you won't have with that person. Um, so I think that, you know, one thing we sort of, a lot of us in the book deal with is embracing uncertainty and talking about what we do have control over and what we don't have control over. And I think um, that's a lot of what, what I think John, the person that I talked about at the beginning, deals with too um, in certain ways. And I, I want to talk about one scene with him that I, I think is sort of related to this. There's um, one time, he, because of his narcissism, he often doesn't think about other people, and including me. And, um, and at one point, he's like, I can't get away, so we're, you know, here's my Skype, let's Skype at 3 o'clock. He doesn't ask if I do Skype sessions. He doesn't say, is this okay? Or he's just like, here it is, because that's the way the world works for John. Um, and I, I wasn't going to do it at first, because I don't, a, 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 I mean, a, um, a colleague of mine calls Skype therapy like doing therapy with a condom on. That, <laughs> that you don't, it just, it's very different from the experience of sitting in a room with someone face to face. You hear them breathe, you look them in the eye. Um, there's an energy to just the physical space. There's nothing pinging or vibrating or dinging and phones in the room or screens on the wall or anything like that. Um, and so he just, he sort of demands lots of things, but we, we do this session and it's a really interesting um, session that happens, but I think that whole session is about something happened in his life where his wife all of a sudden is saying, I might leave you. And he's really thrown for a loop by this. And I think the uncertainty of that, where he had been so certain about so many things in his life, and the thing he's most certain about is that everybody else is an idiot and he knows better, um, but he's also very certain that his wife is never going to leave him. And I think when, when something like that shakes us up, it can be a really good thing. Sometimes uncertainty is the best thing that can happen to us. My therapist <coughs> makes me do this thing where we breathe in, and on the exhale we say, don't know. Like just really breathing with the don't know. And it drives me crazy, and I know that I need it. Just to breathe with the uncertainty, and just to widen out that, like, it's okay, and right, and within uncertainty is possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 